So the elbow and forearm are relatively simple compared to the shoulder complex, but we still have four um, bones involved, um, the scapula, the humerus, the radius, and the ulna. Um, and they, are all, they all work together to provide a lot of really essential function. So the ability to flex and extend our elbow and to pronate and supinate the forearm are really important for things like feeding, you know, like feeding yourself, grooming yourself, um, reaching, throwing, pushing, pulling. So lots of super important functional activities involved with the elbow. Um, I, years ago, I worked with someone who had a um, really interesting work injury. He was a truck driver and he was, uh, there was like a handle to hold on to stepping down from the truck because it was a high cab. He held on to the handle with his dominant hand, stepped down out of the truck, slipped on ice and injured his shoulder, elbow, et cetera, had a bunch of surgeries. Um, and he was limited in his um, supination. So he couldn't shave. He couldn't um, like brush his hair. He couldn't eat by himself. Well, he could eat with his other hand, but it's really hard to um, do uh, like intricate grooming skills like shaving um, with your non-dominant hand. So a lot of time that he was coming in when we first started working with him, he had a big old beard. And one day he came in, he was clean shaven because he finally had enough motion that he could shave. <laughs> he had enough supination. So you don't think about those individual motions as being important in your day-to-day -day life, but they very much are. So um, we'll talk about the um, osteology since we already talked about the proximal humerus in the um, shoulder complex chapter, um, we'll be talking about the distal humerus and the radius and ulna. So of course we wanna identify the joint types and the motions available to each joint. By now, these learning objectives are familiar to you from other chapters. And we want to identify the bony landmarks at each joint and their anatomical position at one another. Um, there is an angle in the um, elbow called the carrying angle. Um, what gives? <laughs> what gives with the carrying angle? Why do we have it? What's the functional significance? And we'll talk about it. And it's an osteological alignment that causes it. And there is a good functional reason for it as well. And we also want to know the functional significance of the radio ulnar and interosseous membrane. So um, in the lower extremity between the tibia and fibula, we had an interosseous membrane. Um, we had that between the radio, the um, radius and ulna as well. Um, and let's talk about it. So I'm probably going to divide this up into two parts, just so it's not too long. So the osteology, the four bones related to the um, forearm elbow complex scapula, because um, the biceps and triceps attached to the um, scapula, the distal humerus, the ulna, and the radius. Okay, important, important stuff here. So the scapula, the um, attachments that we're interested in, besides the shoulder muscle attachments, the coracoid process is the proximal attachment for the short head of the biceps. So um, that's important at the elbow. The supraglenoid tubercle is the proximal attachment for the long head of the biceps, which is also important at the elbow. Um, the infraglenoid tubercle marks the proximal attachment for the long head of the triceps. So biceps and triceps, how much do you work those guys out in the gym, right? Um, really important um, functionally for picking stuff up, pushing up out of chairs, pushing doors open, all sorts of things. Um, without our biceps and triceps, we would hardly be doing anything. At the distal humerus, we have a spool-shaped structure located on the medial side um, that articulates with the ulna to form the humero-ulnar joint, okay? The coronoid fossa is a small pit just superior to the trochlea that accepts the coronoid process 
of the ulna when the elbow is fully flexed. So there's this little pointy part on the ulna, the coronoid process is a point or a, an extended part and a fossa is a pit. So usually when you have a process, you have a fossa for it to go into. So we have the coronoid process and the coronoid fossa. Um, it sounds a lot like the coracoid process of the scapula that we just talked about. And the way I remember them is the um, coracoid and the coronoid. So this is C and this is N. <laughs> so superior to inferior in alphabetical order. You can come up with your own way to remember it, but that's how I remember it. The other, um, the way I remember the coracoid process is it looks sort of like a, a crow's beak. And so say, caw, caw, coracoid. Okay. No, crazy stuff you come up with to remember these things. The capitulum is lateral to the trochlea and it articulates with the head of the radius to form the humeral, um, humeral radial joint. So um, when you look at the trochlea and the capitulum up close, the trochlea is the spool shape and the um, capitulum is the ball shape. So this part is the trochlea. I need to get a different drawing tool. There we go. This part is the trochlea and it's shaped like a spool, like a spool that you would put thread on. And it articulates with the um, ulna. So that jaw of the ulna, which we'll look at in a minute, goes right around that spool. The capitulum um, is a little ball and it's like a little ball that sits on the top of the radial head. So um, you, the capitulum is more um, lateral and it uh, articulates with the radius, which is the lateral bone. The trochlea is more medial and it articulates with the ulna, which is the medial bone. So um, hopefully that will make sense to you. So on the, also on the medial side, so the trochlea is medial, the capitulum is lateral. On the medial side, we have the medial epicondyle um, it's a prominent bone production on the distal humerus's medial side. You can palpate it. Um, when you hit your elbow on something, you're usually hitting your medial epicondyle or your lateral epicondyle. Um, it's a big attachment point for the, the a proximal attachment for most of the wrist flexor muscles, the pronator teres, and the medial collateral ligament of the elbow. So um, remember we had medial and lateral epicondyles of um, other bones like the femur. So when you're specifying these on an osteology quiz, on a um, lab practical, make sure you say the medial epicondyle of the humerus or of the femur or of whatever bone it's on, because there's more than one medial epicondyle in the business. The lateral epicondyle, not surprisingly, is on the other side. It's on the lateral side. Um, and it is the proximal attachment for most of the wrist extensor muscles, the supinator and the lateral collateral elbow ligament. There are these extended portions above the epicondyles that are called the supracondylar ridges. Makes sense, it's above the condyle. They're um, immediately proximal to both epicondyles and they serve as muscle attachments as well. On the posterior side of the distal humerus, you have this big pit, the olecranon fossa, it's relatively deep and broad, especially compared to the coronoid fossa, which is smaller. Um, it's, it's where the olecranon process of the ulna articulates. Um, you can palpate the olecranon fossa if your triceps are relaxed. If your triceps are taut, they're gonna bridge that olecranon fossa, you're not gonna be able to feel it. So you really have to relax the triceps and you can dig your fingers into that olecranon fossa. Most of the structures on the distal humerus um, are palpable except the trochlea and the capitulum because those are inside the joint. But the rest of them, the epicondyles, the supracondylar ridges, the olecranon fossa, the um, coronoid fossa, you can get right in the um, 
little pit between the muscles. So um, a lot of the distal humerus is palpable. Oh my gosh, it's the Loch Ness Monster. Oh no, wait, it's the proximal ulna. <laughs> Thought I had pictures from Scotland for a minute. Um, so no, it's not the Loch Ness Monster, but the ulna has that big jaw, um, which is called the trochlear notch. Interestingly enough, it articulates with the trochlea. Um, the trochlea notch is the jaws of the um, Loch Ness Monster. It's the jaw-like curvature of the proximal ulna that articulates with the trochlea. Um, the inferior tip comes to a point forming the coronoid process. So the jaw of the um, ulna is the trochlear notch. The olecranon process is the top of the, the so the coronoid process is the inferior portion of the trochlear notch. The olecranon process is the superior portion of the trochlear notch. Um, it's the large brunt, blunt proximal tip of the ulna. It's your elbow. If you elbow someone out of the way, you're hitting them with your olecranon process. The rough posterior surface is the distal attachment for the triceps muscles. A big rough surface is muscle attachment area. Remember? Of course you do. So um, we've got our Loch Ness Monster trochlear notch. Right below it, we have another notch, the radial notch. And the radial notch is slightly inferior and lateral to the trochlear notch. And surprise, surprise, it's where the radius articulates with the ulna. No surprise there, right? Um, the coronoid process, it, strength, it strengthens the articulation in the humeral ulnar joint by grabbing the trochlea. So it's the jaws of the Loch Ness Monster on the ulna grabbing onto the trochlea. Um, the radial notch articulates with the radial head. It forms the proximal radial ulnar joint. So the proximal radial ulnar joint is a big player in supination and pronation. The head of the radius is rotating in there. The styloid process um, is the project, a projection of bone that arises from the ulnar head. It's way down there at your wrist. So um, the styloid process, you can palpate it quite easily on your wrist. The radial head is like a wide disc on the proximal end of the radius. That's the little cup that the ball of the capitulum sits in. If you wanna think of it that way, it's like a um, cup and ball game. And the cup of the radius holds the ball of the capitulum. The superior surface of the um, radial head consists of a shallow cup-shaped depression that the ball sits in. It's called the fovea. Um, it articulates with that capitulum forming the humeral radial joint. You can palpate the head of the radius quite easily. I have a video in the module um, palpating the head of the radius and these other lovely structures. The radius itself um, has a lot of lovely um, bony landmarks. The bicipital tuberosity or the radial tuberosity is a big one. Um, it's an enlarged ridge of bone on the anterior medial aspect of the proximal radius. It's the primary distal attachment of the biceps brachii. So it's a big bump because you've got a big muscle pulling on it. So all those lever problems where you have the force um, pulling on a section, that's, a, that's where it's pulling on the bicipital tuberosity or the radial tuberosity. The styloid process is the projection of bone off the lateral radius. So if you look at the radius in ulna, the radius is small at the proximal end and big at the distal end. The ulna is big at the proximal end and small at the distal end. So they're sort of reverse stacked, if you want to think of them that way. Um, the ulnar notch is a small depression on the medial side of the distal radius that articulates with the ulnar head. So there's a radial notch on the ulna and an ulnar notch on the radius. Hopefully that sounds like it makes sense to you. Um, in the next section, we'll talk about the arthrology of the elbow complex.